Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. Israel is weighing its response after fending off a significant Iranian attack. The situation on the ground remains tense. President Biden urging for a diplomatic solution to prevent further escalation. G7 leaders meet pledging a united diplomatic response. We have reactions to Iran's weekend strike. The first criminal trial of former President Trump begins in New York City. What Trump says about the proceedings as he enters the court. How would you react if you came home from a long vacation to find a stranger living in your house? These bold intruders are making headlines recently. Find out what you can do to protect against them. Eyewitnesses describe scenes of chaos and terror. Australian police identify the suspect of a knife attack that killed six near a Sydney beach. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. And to begin the show, the first of former President Trump's criminal trials is beginning in New York. Prosecutors accuse him of falsifying business records related to an alleged affair with adult actress Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. Here's the former president before entering the courtroom. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's team is already setting up in the courtroom. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass is on site. He played a lead role in the Trump Organization's criminal trial in 2022. Soon after Trump arrived at the courthouse, he posted on his Truth Social account, When I walk into that courtroom, I know I will have the love of 200 million Americans behind me, and I will be fighting for the freedom of 325 million Americans. NTD's Daniel Monahan breaks down the case for us. Former President Donald Trump is the first acting or former president in U.S. history to go on trial. The former commander-in-chief is facing 34 charges of falsifying business records. They relate to alleged hush money payments made to adult performer Stephanie Clifford before the 2016 presidential election. President Trump has denied all wrongdoing in the case and has denied that he had an affair with Clifford. In a true social post on Sunday, Trump accused the judge overseeing the case, Judge Juan Mershon, of giving his lawyers a short period of time to review hundreds of thousands of documents a day before his New York trial is scheduled to start. Trump wrote in the post, Election interference has never happened like this in the USA before and hopefully will never happen again. We are now a nation in serious decline, a failing nation, but we will soon be a great nation again. Trump discussed the case at a campaign rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday. On Monday in New York City, I will be forced to sit fully gagged. I'm not allowed to talk. Can you believe it? They want to take away my constitutional right to talk. Mershon imposed a gag order on Trump in March at prosecutors' request, blocking him from speaking about witnesses concerning their participation in the case. He extended the order on April 1st to cover his own family members and those of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, though Mershon and Bragg themselves are not included. Trump lashed out at Judge Mershon, calling him crooked and accusing him of suffering from TDS. TDS. Does anyone know what TDS is? <laughs> Correct. Trump derangement syndrome. Trump called the trial a Biden trial and implied the proceedings were intended to undermine his candidacy. 
as the radical left Democrat Party seeks to do anything possible to keep me from running and winning in this election. The former president plans to take the stand in the trial. Trump said on Friday, quote, I would testify absolutely and called the trial a scam. The trial will not be televised, with New York having strict rules about cameras in courtrooms. It is expected to take about six to eight weeks. Jury selection starts Monday, and the trial will take place every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, with Wednesday as a break day. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And joining us now is Dan McMillan, former prosecutor with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, now founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to campaign finance reform. Dan, welcome. Good to see you today. Jury selection today will be watched very closely for signs of bias. How airtight is this process? What are the risks and what should people watch out for? Well, on the one hand, we don't really have to worry, I think, about an unfair jury being selected, a jury that's unfair either to defense or prosecution. The process is going to be very rigorous. It's going to take, I think, weeks. Um, okay. It's going to involve an extensive questioning of all potential jurors for any possible source of bias. But on the other hand, uh, every single day, there will be an opportunity for President Trump to hold a press conference denouncing the process, claiming that this or that juror who, in his view, is biased, was nonetheless uh, allowed on the jury. Uh, that has been his approach and that of his attorneys all along. Okay. Um, and it's also an opportunity for President Trump to have a tremendous amount of free media time, um, which has always been one of his strengths campaigning. Even if he doesn't raise as much money as President Biden uh, for campaign advertising and other campaign expenses, yeah. he often, is, as in 2016, has been able to compensate for that uh, by free media time. And Dan, uh, I just want to turn now to... I'm sorry, go ahead. Thanks so much. I just want to turn now to a, a more of the legal aspects here. Bragg's charging Trump under a law that allows him to elevate misdemeanors to felonies. What's the potential impact of this action on the case and on the public's perception of fairness here? Well, the thing is that even legal experts who are Democrats agree this is really a stretch. I mean, strictly speaking, yeah, you can, Bragg can legitimately turn this, this crime that normally is handled as a misdemeanor into a felony, but it's basically the charge is falsifying public records, uh, falsifying business records to conceal the fact that uh, he funded a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels in the last weeks before the, the 2016 election, because he thought that Dan, if Daniels went public, that could embarrass him and hurt him at the polls. And not reporting that payment as an in-kind contribution to his campaign was a violation of federal campaign finance law. But it's not a huge violation. It's, it's a stretch to convert this into a felony. And more importantly, I think, in the eyes of the public, it is clear most most Americans or a lot of Americans see this as pretty small potatoes compared to the other charges against President Trump mm. and consequently uh, feeds the narrative that these prosecutions, that all the prosecutions are politically motivated, which he's been claiming all along. So what evidence and arguments will Bragg need to present to secure a felony conviction from the jury? I, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to offer an opinion. I have not seen the evidence myself. All right. Not having, and also as a former prosecutor, uh, it's not a good idea to express an opinion about the quality of the evidence if you haven't seen all the evidence. That's fair. Okay, I just want to turn now to President Trump attempting to assert some form of presidential immunity from the charges that he's facing. That was rejected, and the judge said that he waited too long as his reason. How do both those arguments stack up legally? Well. It's hard to see how the presidential immunity argument is relevant to this trial. President Trump has claimed immunity for all actions committed while he was president. This is about an action taken before he was president in the fall of 2016. On the other hand, he has claimed pre immune, this presidential immunity uh, specifically for uh, the charges in, in Georgia of trying to tamper with the result of that election 
and the charge that he incited the Capitol riot. Okay, um, and I don't know of a single legal expert who takes that seriously, but the Supreme Court is hearing question is, is taking arguments on that question, the, the yeah. presidential immunity argument, I think on April 25th. Okay, That's so not lastly, been decided Dan, yet. Okay, and just finally, Dan, we have about 20 seconds for your response. How could this, this, these, these decisions made in this case impact future presidents? I think it's going to make future prosecutors hesitate before bringing charges against a former president, because I don't think this trial is going to make is going to make all the prosecutions look very good. All right. OK, thank you so much for your time. Dan McMillan, former prosecutor of the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America. Thank you. Thank you, Stefania. Next up, major media organizations are urging President Biden and former President Trump to hold debates before November's election. About a dozen organizations posted an open letter yesterday. The letter says general election debates have played a vital role in every presidential election in the past 50 years, going back to 1976. The letter also says that tens of millions have tuned in to watch the competition for the votes of American citizens. This year, it's uncertain whether the two candidates will face off on a stage ahead of the election. Biden has not publicly commented to committed to debating Trump, although he hasn't ruled it out. Trump has said he would debate Biden anytime, anywhere. The Associated Press, CBS News, CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC, PBS, NPR, and C-SPAN are among the media outlets that released the statement. And a new poll shows Trump and Biden remain locked in a tight race for the presidency. The poll by the New York Times and Siena College had 46% of voters say they support Trump. 45% say they are backing Biden. That's a tighter race in the poll's last survey in February when Trump led Biden by five points. The new poll shows 64% of voters feel the country is heading in the wrong direction. Close to 80% felt economic conditions were either fair or poor. Biden's approval rating is 38%. And presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he will not run on the Libertarian Party ticket. The independent candidate tells ABC News he has met with Libertarian Party leaders many times and kept the door open, but now says his campaign doesn't need the party. In January, Kennedy told CNN he was still considering the partnership. He will instead continue to run as an independent. A New York campaign staffer for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been fired for misrepresentation. Last week, a video circulated of Rita Palma encouraging an audience to back Kennedy on the New York ballot because it would help former President Trump beat President Biden in November. Palma falsely identified herself as the New York State Director of Kennedy's campaign, according to a campaign spokesperson. After the campaign watched the video, Palma was fired. Palma released a statement after the firing. She said her time with Team Kennedy was one of the best political adventures of her life. She added that she holds no grudges and looks forward to the next seven months of watching, quote, Bobby shine. U.S. Senate candidate Arizona Carrie Lake reportedly raised more than $4 million during the first three months of this year. But her Democratic opponent, Congresswoman, Congressman Ruben Gallio, nearly doubled what she brought in during the same time period. His campaign says he raised seven and a half million dollars. The winner in November will succeed Kirsten Sinema. The one-time Democrat turned independent decided not to run for re-election this year. Political observers are closely watching the race in Arizona. The outcome could determine which party controls the Senate next year. Coming up. The White House says the U.S. won't participate if Israel chooses to strike back at Iran. G7 leaders meet with President Biden, pledging a united diplomatic response. And the Iran attack is putting pressure on U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson to pass aid bill, an aid bill for Israel and Ukraine. More on his response in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. You may know me from my many years on television. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I felt this slight pressure in my chest, just slight. I thought, oh, it's nothing, it'll go away. I didn't get it. I did not get it. But a few days later, while shopping at a boutique, that pressure returned much stronger. 
It felt like an elephant pressing on my chest. I had a, a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. I was rushed into surgery where I received two stents in my arteries. Stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. That's why I'm in front of you today, asking you to join me in supporting the American Heart Association by becoming a monthly donor. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR, the next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. I'm so grateful to the American Heart Association. Their research helped save my life. I can enjoy life with my children, my grandchildren, and my friends. Heart disease is America's number one killer and your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. Please, listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Thank you. My dad's name was David. He always talked about getting life insurance, and now it's too late. No one was expecting my husband Dave to suffer from a heart attack. We didn't have life insurance. We thought we had more time. Don't be Dave, and don't wait until it's too late to get the life insurance coverage you need. And if you don't have enough insurance to cover funeral costs, credit card debt, and other expenses, your family is going to get stuck with the bill. Call now to get affordable life insurance. Just call. 800-494-1562. If you're over 50, you can't be turned down for this insurance, regardless of your health. Plus, there's no medical exam, no health questions. Your rate will never go up. Your coverage will never go down and rates start as low as $5 a week. Remember, don't be Dave. Call now. Call now. 800-494-1562. Israel fought off an aerial attack from Iran over the weekend, signaling a major escalation of tensions in the Middle East. Iran launched over 300 projectiles on Saturday in its first direct attack on Israel from Iranian territory. Israel said it and its allies shot down 99% of the projectiles. These included cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and drone attacks. A few caused light damage to a military base in the south of the country. Iran said the attack was in response to what it claims was an Israeli strike on its embassy compound in Syria earlier this month. Israel's foreign minister said he wouldn't rule out retaliating against Iran, but President Biden is pushing for a diplomatic solution to prevent further escalation. Israel reopened its airspace early yesterday morning and lifted orders for its citizens to take shelter. In a statement, the Israeli military said its air force, along with strategic partner nations, successfully intercepted dozens of aerial threats. The attack came less than two weeks after a suspected Israeli strike in Syria. Iran said two of its generals were killed in what it says was a consulate building. Israel says the target was being used by Iran's military. Iran said Sunday its attacks targeted the Nevatim airbase in southern Israel, from where it says the Israeli strike was launched. An Israeli military video released Sunday shows a small crater in the ground and workers repairing damage. Israel said this was taken at the Nevatim airbase in the aftermath of the attack. Another video released by the military shows Israeli jets intercepting what it says were Iranian drones. Israel's military spokesperson Rear Admiral Hagari said the attack came from multiple locations, including Iran, Iraq, Yemen and Lebanon. He said it was met by a coalition led by the U.S., Britain, France and other allies. Together, we intercepted 99% of the threats towards Israel. Together, we thwarted Iran's attack. 
In the streets of Jerusalem, Israelis reacted to Saturday night's attack, saying they don't want a war with Iran. None of us in Israel want a big war. Um, so I hope that's it, and I hope Iran will stop now. We didn't want the war with Hamas. They attacked us. We don't want the war with Iran. They attack us. We don't want a war with Iran. Israeli President Isaac Herzog said the attack amounted to a declaration of war, but that Israel's restraint showed it was not seeking conflict. He hinted that Israel's decision to not immediately retaliate was in part influenced by talks with allies, including the United States. Naturally, we always listen to our partners and allies. We respect their view. We are also always uh, reviewing all our options. And as I said, we will take whatever it takes to protect and defend our people. White House officials said the U.S. will not take part in a counteroffensive against Iran. National Security Spokesperson John Kirby said, quote, We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. Iran's foreign minister, meanwhile, said Tehran informed Washington its attack on Israel would be limited and for self-defense. The U.S. denies this. The foreign minister also said Iran has no intention of escalating the conflict. We are not looking to target American people and bases in the region. We have never welcomed development of tension in the region. Iran's army chief of staff said Iran's response would be much larger if Israel retaliates. He also warned that American bases could be attacked if it helps Israel retaliate. A spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces said Iran should not be taken for their word, and Israel needs to decide what's best for its own security. We also need to think that we don't necessarily need to believe what they are telling us. The fact that they've announced that it's concluded, we've had rockets fired at us by one of their proxies this morning from Lebanon by Hezbollah. The U.S. and the rest of the G7 affirmed their full support for Israel on Sunday. They released a statement reading, Iran has further stepped toward the destabilization of the region and risks provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation. This must be avoided. We will continue to work to stabilize the situation and avoid further escalation. President Biden is asking Israel to use caution in any reaction to Iran's attack. He called an emergency G7 meeting yesterday, pledging a coordinated diplomatic response. The White House says it's up to Israel how to respond, but that the U.S. won't participate in a retaliatory strike while still committed to defending Israel. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has reactions to Iran's weekend attack. Leaders of the G7 in a virtual meeting Sunday condemned Iran's attack and reaffirmed commitment to Israel's security. The group accused Iran of destabilizing the region and provoking an uncontrollable escalation. National Security Spokesman John Kirby says the attack did not necessarily have to mean the start of a broader regional war. He told NBC Sunday the U.S. does not want war with Iran, is not looking for escalation, and will continue to help Israel defend itself. Kirby also called on China to do more to de-escalate Middle East tensions, given the Chinese regime's close ties with Tehran. The United Nations Security Council held an emergency meeting Sunday to discuss Iran's attack on Israel. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres calling for maximum restraint and de-escalation. The meeting ended without any action. Former U.S. Ambassador to the UN John Bolton, saying Israel should retaliate, called for a powerful response. So this is an American interest to make sure that Iran, which is the principal threat to international peace and security in the region, uh, is at a minimum put in its place. To spare Israel, to spare the Gulf Arabs, to spare us from the threat uh, that they pose. Iran on Sunday threatened Israel and the U.S. of a larger attack should either country retaliate. Senator John Fetterman told CNN he disagrees with President Biden's stance on not taking part in a possible Israeli counterstrike. I think it really demonstrates how it's astonishing that we are not uh, standing firmly with Israel and there should never be any kinds of conditions on all that. Former President Trump on Truth Social said the attack would never have happened if he were in office. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. World leaders took to X yesterday to express concern after Iran launched the attack against Israel. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen strongly condemned the attack, calling it blatant and unjustifiable. She called on Iran and its proxies to immediately cease the attacks. The EU leader also said that all actors must refrain from further escalation and work to restore stability in the region. 
Vice President Kamala Harris pointed, posted a photograph of President Biden meeting with his national security team, saying their support for Israel's security is ironclad. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs also condemned the attack, saying Canada stands with Israel, the Israeli people, and Jewish communities in Canada and abroad. Israel came under fire again today, this time from Hezbollah in Lebanon. This after Iran said Saturday night's barrage was the end of its operation against Israel. Hezbollah, an Iran-backed terrorist group operating out of Lebanon, continues to attack Israel as it has since the war started in October last year. Israel retaliated with strikes on Hezbollah targets inside Lebanon. Hezbollah says its actions were independent of Iran's attack on Israel. They said it was in response to Israel's war in Gaza. Israeli officials said Hezbollah operates as a proxy of Iran and that this is a continuation of Iran's attempts to destabilize the region. Violence broke out in the West Bank over the weekend in the search for a missing 14-year-old Israeli boy. Police say the boy was killed in a terrorist attack and that his body was found on Saturday. Authorities said that the boy was taking sheep out to graze when he went missing. Palestinian officials say hundreds of armed Israeli civilians set fire to several homes and cars in a town near Ramallah on Friday night. Israel's defense minister warned the public about taking the law into their own hands. The IDF says it dispersed violent riots and removed Israeli civilians from the town. The military said dozens of both Palestinians and Israelis were injured in several incidents. Palestinian officials said Israeli security forces fired tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse the crowds. Now, as Israel faces an increasing threat from Iran, U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson said he would try to pass an aid bill this week. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise also said the House will respond to the attack with a measure that holds Iran and its proxies accountable. President Biden yesterday spoke to congressional leaders, urging them to pass a spending bill to support U.S. allies. Speaker Johnson did not say whether the bill would include assistance for Ukraine and other allies. The House remains deeply divided over providing further assistance to Ukraine. No major aid package has passed for Kyiv since January 2023. Coming up, the Biden administration is betting big on computer chip manufacturing in the U.S. More on a $6 million investment into a major chip maker. And a government employee breaks through barricades during the January 6th, 2021 Capitol breach, but avoids charges. More on the case when we return. When I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt uh, uh, much better. I did feel, actually, an effect. And I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times. And so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then a second time, I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times. And wow, that was a big difference because suddenly I could feel why wow, I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of kids just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. Show it. If you're happy and you know it, take your shot. And when you 
you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to lushrunners.org right away. I'm Arian Pastar in South America, Brazil, and we are NTD News. Welcome back. The Biden administration will provide up to $6.4 billion in direct funding for Samsung Electronics. The money is to develop a computer chip manufacturing and research cluster in Texas. The funding is part of a total investment that is expected to ex exceed $40 billion when private money is factored in. The government support comes from the Chips and Science Act, which aims to revive domestic production of advanced computer chips. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says the proposed project will make Texas a state-of-the-art semiconductor destination. Raimondo said she expects the project will create at least 17,000 construction jobs and more than 4,500 manufacturing jobs. The first factory is expected to be operational in 2026 and the second in 2027. And next, the Rust movie Armorer, who was convicted of involuntary manslaughter, will soon find out her punishment. A judge in New Mexico will sentence Hannah Gutierrez Reed today. A jury found her guilty last month for the onset shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Her job as armorer made her responsible for gun safety and storage on the set. Somehow Gutierrez Reed placed a live bullet in a prop gun Alec Baldwin was holding, and the weapon discharged. Hutchins died, and the film's director also was shot but survived. Gutierrez Reed faces up to 18 months in prison and a $5,000 fine. Prosecutors have asked the judge to give her the maximum. They say she has not taken any responsibility for her actions. While the defense has argued she should receive probation because she has no prior criminal history. Alec Baldwin also is accused of involuntary manslaughter. He's expected to stand trial in July. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges. And a government worker was found to have broken the law during the January 6th, 2021 events at the U.S. Capitol, but wasn't prosecuted. That's according to an internal report from the Treasury Department Office of Inspector General that was obtained by the Epoch Times. The report reveals that the employee was, on, was present on Capitol grounds during the breach. The worker denied witnessing violence or engaging in illegal activities, though video evidence contradicted these claims. The employee, who was not named, breached barricades and stayed on the grounds for about two hours. The investigation confirmed that the worker entered restricted areas without authorization. However, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia declined to prosecute the individual in May 2022. The OIG told the Epic Times the employee is no longer with the Treasury Department, but details about their departure remain undisclosed. Two bodies were found in Oklahoma after the suspicious disappearance of two women. Officials say the bodies were found in the rural area of Texas County. It's the same location where 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly disappeared. Four people have been arrested and charged with murder in connection with the disappearance. The two women went missing last month while traveling through rural Oklahoma to pick up children. It's still unclear what, if any, relationship the four suspects had with the missing women. The bodies will be transferred to the medical examiner as part of the investigation. These opportunists are taking over properties that don't belong to them. Squatters across the country show up at, say, a rental home that's been unoccupied for a month or two. They move their things in and the cops, they say they can't do anything about it. How is that possible? 
It's called adverse possession when a squatter stays long enough to own your property. To understand this phenomenon, I spoke with Paul Golden, partner at Coffee Modica LLP and author of Litigating Adverse Possession Cases. Paul Golden, thank you for joining us. I wanted to start by asking, what is this word squatting? It seems to me that it's uh, this colloquial term that people kind of throw around willy-nilly, but the, the, the world of attorneys probably looks at it very differently or with much more nuance. Can you talk a bit about you know, what, this, what this means? Sure. Well, squatting seems to um, cover a lot of things in, in, in the way that normal human beings speak, um, especially non-attorneys. But even attorneys throw that word around uh, a lot when they when they might mean several things. Um, my interpretation of the word squatting is when you uh, trespass onto property and then you occupy it and then you reside on it. And your goal is to uh, stay there as long as you can as a quasi resident, as a quasi tenant. Um, until you are ultimately removed. When does somebody go from being an intruder where they just got onto the property um, to being a squatter where they have some kind of right to be there? It's a, it's a good question without a, without a great answer. Um, certainly if, if someone is just an intruder, um, it would be, the, anyone would be allowed to uh, push them out, kick them out, uh, use whatever tools were necessary to, to kick them out. Um, I, I can't imagine a court saying if someone suddenly intruded into your home that they have a right to be there and you have to let them be. That would never happen. Um, but if someone has occupied the place peacefully for a long enough period of time, um, there will be some courts who will say, um, that you know you have to use the the courts as a means to kick them out or at least the police to uh, to to kick them out why can't the police just come in yeah and remove someone once they're considered a squatter it's up to you as the citizen to do your best to convince the police to um, have that person removed um, whether the police will do it or not is a totally separate question um and and we in the public who don't work in the in the with the police don't exactly know what would motivate the police in certain contexts to push somebody out and in other contexts would just have them say listen this is a a matter for the court um and i'll, I'll let you have it your way and you're going to have to find a judge and have to do it the legal way um that would probably if if uh you know you never want to lie to the police but presumably the more the police think that the person just moved into the house and it's the more it's clear to them that they really don't have a right to be there um and the more it seems to them that there's a danger of, of letting them stay in your home or whatever property you've got one would think the police would be more likely to kick the person out yeah and with all these Squatting cases making headlines recently. I think uh, property owners are getting concerned. Um, what can people do to protect against squatters if they don't already have them? The obvious answer to that would be uh, to have a burglar alarm. Um, and uh, as, as soon as you found out that the the burglar alarm had, had had been tripped, you know, you'd call the police or have it automatically set up so so that would happen. That's the obvious answer, maybe a little bit of an expensive answer. Um, another answer would be to constantly monitor your property and, and not let more than a few days go by without uh, checking up on your property or having someone check up on your property. If you don't have those tools, another way of doing it would be to have um, sort of some sort of uh, video monitor and um, <clears throat> the very least, perhaps you could show the police, well, here's where they moved in, here's how they got in, they broke in, et cetera. Um, that, that might be somewhat helpful as well. Paul Golden, thank you so much for your time today. It was a great pleasure, thank you. Coming up, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky draws a parallel between the situation in Israel and his own country. More on his comments in just a moment.
This is it, the culmination of everything our young athlete has worked for these past months. He's filled with determination. You can see it in his face. Is today the day he overcomes? And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's on fire. Nothing can stop him. Watch him as he heads towards the goal. Oh, he's blocked hard. But that doesn't stop him. He's a warrior. He's back up. His eyes are on the goal. He's set up for the shot. He shoots. Goal! Achieving goals like this is only possible with the monthly support of people just like you. Please call the number on your screen right now and give your monthly support to Shriners Hospitals for Children so other children can reach their goals too. If you give just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we will send you your very own Love to the Rescue Blanket as a reminder of the love you're giving us. Because of monthly support of people like you, nothing is stopping me from achieving my goals. And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's going left. Oh, he fakes right and continues. Look at those moves. He takes the shot. Goal! Good shot! <laughs> Please call or go online now. If operators are busy, Call again or go to loveshriners.org to give right away. Your monthly gift helps kids achieve their goals. Goal! Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans expertly roasted in-house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes, Day's Coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. Made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. Welcome back. Sydney police have identified the perpetrator of fatal stabbings near Bondi Beach in Australia. People witnessed scenes of chaos at a shopping center as the attacker killed six people before being shot and killed by police. New South Wales police say 40-year-old Joel Couchy was responsible. Footage published on social media by an eyewitness showed crowds of people running to evacuate the mall as the body of the attacker laid on the ground surrounded by officers. No, I work in the cafe the way the guy was shot, like right in front. I'm feeling really terrified to be honest and tired, I don't know, to be honest what I'm, it's like mixed reaction. I sort of turn around and everyone's screaming and sprinting and they're like, it was like a movie, like a horror movie and the fear in everyone's face is just like terrifying and everyone's just pushing and pushing. New South Wales police said five of the six victims killed were women, while eight people, including a nine-month-old baby, was taken to the hospital with stab wounds. At this stage, they did not believe the attack was terrorism-related. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said there was no indication yet of the man's motive. In a written statement, the attacker's family said they were devastated by the events and they had no issue with police shooting their son. They called his actions truly horrific, saying they were still trying to comprehend what had happened. Yeah. The family also said that he battled mental health issues since he was a teenager. And a church in a suburb of Sydney, Australia, was the site of another stabbing today. It came just two days after the deadly attack at the shopping mall. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing. 
The church was live streaming when the assault occurred. The video shows a man lunging at a bishop before repeatedly stabbing him during a sermon. A number of people were hurt, but there were no life-threatening injuries. The victims are receiving medical treatment. Officers arrested a male and took him to an undisclosed location. And next, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has condemned Iran's attack on Israel. He said yesterday his country needs help from its allies to fend off threats from the air, just as Israel did. In a nightly address, Zelensky said that, quote, Israel was not alone in this defense. Adding that, quote, when Ukraine says that the allies cannot turn a blind eye to Russian missiles and drones, it means that it is necessary to act and act strongly. The war in Ukraine has escalated in recent weeks. Ukraine's top commander said on Sunday that Russian forces aimed to capture the town of Shavis Yar by May 9th setting the stage for an important battle for control of high ground in the east, where Russia is focusing its assaults. Since late March, Russia has launched multiple major attacks on Ukrainian energy infrastructure, inflicting significant damage to the Ukrainian power system and causing emergency power cuts in some regions. This senior employee at a plant that is undisclosed for security reasons says he had to go to the bomb shelter after seeing that no power units were left intact. Iran has supplied thousands of drones to Russia throughout its invasion of Ukraine. They've been used to exhaust Ukrainian air defenses and hit infrastructure far from the front lines. And for round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Stay with us and we'll bring you more in the next two hours. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We our NTD. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, the things I see, I just want to turn away. The dreams I have, the stories I could tell, will they still be possible? This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. Where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere. But it begins here.
Ganjing World, a brighter way of life. It was spectacular. So beautiful. I thought that I was going to heaven. Oh, it was electric. I'm getting chills talking about it. It gets a 10 from me, that's for sure. It was that good. Absolutely marvelous. Hands down, the best show I've ever seen. It's emotional, it's captivating, it's visual. Every single bit of your senses is engaged. Oh my gosh, it was a riot. I didn't expect to laugh so much and also be touched so much. I was literally looking for something which was magical, uplifting, and it was way more than that. The music was just so beautiful and it and it really lit up the room. And there's nothing like live music. The combination of the music and the dancing was sometimes uplifting. You know, my toes are tapping and I want to get out of my seat. But it was also very calming. I think it's magnificent. It's magnificent to see another part of Chinese culture that a lot of people don't get to see. And the stories are amazing. The execution, the dance is amazing. The flips, the aerial movement, it was amazing. It wasn't anything I've ever seen before. Absolutely perfection. I, there wasn't even one flaw. I must say I'm so highly impressed with the level of the dancers, their technique. Just all the concepts are absolutely wonderful. The costumes, they were works of art. The way they used the costumes to create part of the image, it was just absolutely mind-blowing. I thought I was going to come to see some amazing dancing, but I learned so much about the Chinese culture. They're actually telling you the story of their life, of their culture, of their history, and bringing it full circle so that we can see and enjoy it. There was an encouragement to go back to that divine nature and those divine values. This experience for me is transcendent. It was a communication to the soul and the spirit. And I cried, I think, the whole time because it was so amazing. It was powerful and it is something that's needed in today's society. People nowadays go to the doctors, the psychiatrists for pills, for antidepressants. This, this is the antidepressant, the best. I knew it was gonna be good. It's a billion times better than I even thought it would be. I've heard people say, you don't wanna miss this. And I would fully agree. I'm going to tell everyone to come see it. You have to. Definitely going to come back next year. Totally inspirational. You have to go see this. Everyone needs to see this. Don't miss it. It's a once-in-a-lifetime must-see that will change their lives forever. These are all farmers. Maybe no, not this not one. No, farm anymore. But here is a farm, right? No, there's also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food, so we don't eat meat, but we eat insects. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. We've been spending a lot more time than ever at home these days. So maybe now you've just noticed cold air coming in from a couple windows or that your patio door isn't closing fully, which means you're losing heat in the winter, losing cooling in the summer, losing money all year long. 
And that means now is the time for new windows and patio doors from Renewal by Anderson. Most installations are usually done in just one day. Renewal by Anderson windows and doors can help lower your heating bills and air conditioning bills with their most energy efficient glass available. Only their windows are made with Fibrex material proven to be two times stronger than vinyl and they're backed by a 20 year warranty. And right now, when you buy one window or patio door, get one at 40% off. Plus, there's no money down, no payments for 12 months, and no interest for 12 months. Plus, an additional $200 off your entire purchase. 1-800-968-1443. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Yeah. Oh. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. The first criminal trial of former President Trump begins in New York City. What Trump says about the proceedings as he enters the court. Nations calling for restraint following Iran's aerial attack on Israel this past weekend. We have the latest response from President Biden. Gulf markets dropped slightly yesterday in reaction to Iran's unprecedented attack on Israeli territory. Investors are resuming today. How worried are they about a wider contagion? It's been almost three weeks since the tragic Baltimore Bridge disaster, which killed six people. Now the FBI is getting involved. More on the investigation. A second stabbing in Sydney in just three days. This time, a bishop was attacked during a sermon. The details on the casualties. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Tensions are high in the Middle East after Iran launched in a direct aerial attack on Israel over the weekend. The White House says President Biden wants to see tensions de-escalate and doesn't want a wider war in the region. Uh, and just because uh, Iran conducted this unprecedented attack, which we and our Israeli partners and other partners thwarted uh, doesn't mean that we should just accept uh, a, a constant rising escalation in the region. The president's not going to accept that. He wants to see things de-escalate. And everything we're going to do from this point forward is going to be designed to continue to try to, to reach that outcome. Israel is weighing its response following the attack from Iran. The country's war cabinet is meeting now after an earlier meeting last night. Israeli officials said the war cabinet favors retaliation, but was divided over the timing and scale of any such response. Biden has told Netanyahu the U.S. will not participate in any Israeli counteroffensive against Iran. The U.S., the U.K., France, Germany, Russia, China, as well as the European Union and the United Nations all called for restraint. The U.S. military said it intercepted 80 drones and six missiles from Iran and Yemen during the attack on Israel. In a video on social media, Biden thanked U.S. military personnel who helped defend Israel. Hey, you guys are the best in the whole damn world, man. 
the whole war. Okay, that's true. No, that, that's not that's not hyperbole, man. Both these both these squadrons, you're incredible, absolutely incredible. You made an enormous difference, potentially saving a lot of lives. And thanks to extraordinary skill, the United States helped Israel take down nearly all those incoming missiles. You're, you're remarkable. Later today, Biden will be hosting Iraq's prime minister to discuss regional stability. Their discussion will focus on the economy and the U.S. military presence in Iraq. Portions of Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel were launched from Iraq, and a U.S. base in Iraq knocked down at least one Iranian ballistic missile. Meanwhile, Iran says it didn't make prearranged agreement with any country prior to its attack. Iran's foreign ministry says Tehran notified neighboring countries days before the attack, but didn't make any deals about it. And as tensions escalate between Israel and Iran, there are also updates to the war in Gaza. Israel is pressing ahead with its operations in the territory. Israel overnight launched more airstrikes on Gaza. The Israel military said even while under attack from Iran, we have not lost sight, not for a moment, of our critical mission in Gaza. As fighting continues, displaced Palestinians are heading toward northern Gaza in an attempt to return to their homes. Large crowds of people can be seen walking along the coast. The Israeli military today renewed warnings from Palestinians not to return to northern Gaza. The military said the area is still an active battle zone. A military spokesman said that Palestinians should stay in southern Gaza where they have been told to shelter. Joining us now for a live look at the aftermath of this unprecedented attack on Israel is the CEO and Jerusalem bureau chief of the Jewish news syndicate, Alex Treyman. Alex, thank you so much for joining us again. Israel said 99% of Iran's drones and missiles were intercepted. What explains the success of this defense against this massive attack? Well, Israel has some significant uh, missile defense technologies, several different programs, including the Iron Dome program for short term uh, missiles, short uh, range missiles and drones. We have the Arrow 2 and the Arrow 3 systems that actually shoot ballistic missiles out in the atmosphere. We also have the David Sling. We also have a, a significant fleet of F 35s and F 16s that were in the air. Uh, and in addition to that, there was a coalition of countries, including the United States, the UK, France, Jordan, and Saudi. Arabia that all use their air defense capabilities to uh, shoot out most of these drones, uh, all, all of the drones, all of the cruise missiles, and even most of the ballistic missiles, which only take about 10 minutes to get from Iran all the way to Israel. Now, Alex, officials say the U.S. shot down almost half of the 150 attack drones launched against Israel. How are Israelis feeling about U.S.-Israel relations right now? Well, certainly, Israelis is very uh, grateful to the United States for assisting in the missile defense. Uh, you know, there. The Israelis do feel like they uh, depend on the U.S. for, for cooperation, uh, and they feel much stronger when the United States is at their back. There's no doubt that there's been tensions in the relationship between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu administration. Uh, but as we saw last night, when it comes to Israel's defense, uh, the United States is there. When it comes to uh, whether the United States will allow Israel to, to counterattack and to actually win the wars that it's engaged in, there are some big question marks. Now, what's the mood like in Israel after the successful defense of this attack? Well, obviously, on Saturday night, there was great fear and anticipation, knowing that uh, drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles were coming in. Uh, but uh, we saw big fireworks overhead uh, when the ballistic missiles arrived. Uh, very grateful that they were, for the most part, shot out of the sky. Uh, and once uh, Iran had announced that uh, the attack was over from their perspective and the Israeli intelligence concurred with that attack, it's kind of been a return to life as usual. Israelis are very, very resilient here. We're used to terror attacks. We're, we're used to being hit from all different sides. And Israelis are very good at sort of picking up the pieces and getting back uh, to their routine. However, there is still uh, anticipation as to whether Israel will respond to Iran's attack. Uh, the Iranians have threatened to hit Israel again and even harder if Israel does counterattack. So Israelis not sure whether uh, this was just an isolated incident or the beginning of phase two of a wider regional war. Yeah, and speaking about what's next, uh, Israel's war cabinet is recommending retaliating against this attack, like we were saying earlier. Uh, what, what are the, some of the factors the cabinet could be considering as it mulls, around, mulls over this counteroffensive? 
Well, certainly, uh, whether the United States and uh, others, other actors uh, in the international community would support uh, such an attack, and if they would be willing and ready uh, to provide the same type of uh, missile defense shield that they provided on Saturday night. Uh, we can't know for certain how Israel would have fared on Saturday night if the United States and other partners uh, did not participate uh, in the missile defense. So uh, certainly all of these capabilities do weigh into the factor. Uh, they all factor into the equation. Uh, questions of what Israel can do to re to reestablish deterrence from Iran so that Iran understands that they can't just send over 110 ballistic missiles and close to 200 other drones and missiles at Israel. Uh, how can Israel respond in, in a forceful way, but not in a way which would spark a much wider regional conflict? Alex, I just wanted to turn to something else as, as we wrap up here. Is, Israel has faced heavy criticism um, uh, by anti-Israeli forces, you know, calling Israel um, this uh, 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 sort of oppressor of Palestinians. But now Israel is a victim of yet another unprecedented attack. How is this uh, PR war playing out right now? Well, I don't think Israel is doing a great job necessarily in winning the PR war, but I don't think that that's because of Israel's uh, efforts. You know, we see in the social media, uh, overwhelmingly, the algorithms are favoring uh, pro, pro-Palestinian, pro pro-Hamas content. Uh, and I think that the war has been un- unproperly characterized as just the latest round of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What we saw on Saturday night is that this isn't the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is Israel versus Iran and its terror proxies, which include Hamas and Gaza, but also include Hezbollah and Lebanon, also includes Houthis in Yemen and includes Iran itself. So this is really like a, a bigger war uh, and has very little to do or only partially to do with the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and, uh, you know, so unfortunately, there's been a lot of lies and the narrative warfare is an important part of this conflict. Uh, Israel's not winning the war of the narratives and, and Hamas and others have been banking on winning that war of narratives. Uh, Israel's going to have to have a decisive victory in order to turn the tide of public relations in its favor. All right. Alex Treyman, CEO and Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate. Thank you so much for your time once again. Thanks for having me. Up ahead, the first criminal trial of former President Trump begins in New York City. What Trump says about the proceedings as he enters the court. And a homeless crisis overtakes a rural community in southern Oregon. The town's camping ban goes before the Supreme Court this month. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain unmarked boxes. So your private matters stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. خوشگو دایکانی از دیه ما کاری که دور دور لحمو چمت دیموکراسی و مافکانی مرو و انسانیت او بارو دوخی که ایست های به تایبند ایراق و سوریا بشه که در گره تو بوا و حالانه که اداره او بوا ما کرد کاری ما بو او هفت روش بون بو او دا عشز کرد تام بو مدکره قوتی نیز گریا با ما متشکر به هر پیدن نب و باوان رحم نب قدمنا سوالان they would literally be auctioned in front of soldiers and then their soldiers begin to dig. Zaruran, 
وحشیگریکی توان توان ایاره زن به کی جار بود جورا لام افراد نکی را وات عادی کی زور زوریان میگه که همان روزانه دست فروشیده کی Imagine being a, a child, you know, having a child mentality and these evil people come and wheel you away from the only safety you've ever known. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. First of former President Trump's criminal trials is beginning in New York. Prosecutors accuse him of falsifying business records related to an alleged affair with adult actress Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. Here's the former president before entering the courtroom. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's team is already setting up in the courtroom. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass is on site. He played a lead role in the Trump Organization's criminal trial in 2022. Soon after Trump arrived at the courthouse, he posted on his Truth Social account, When I walk into that courtroom, I know I will have the love of 200 million Americans behind me, and I will be fighting for the freedom of 325 million Americans. And today's Daniel Monahan breaks down the case for us. Former President Donald Trump is the first acting or former president in U.S. history to go on trial. The former commander-in-chief is facing 34 charges of falsifying business records. They relate to alleged hush money payments made to adult performer Stephanie Clifford before the 2016 presidential election. President Trump has denied all wrongdoing in the case and has denied that he had an affair with Clifford. In a true social post on Sunday, Trump accused the judge overseeing the case, Judge Juan Mershon, of giving his lawyers a short period of time to review hundreds of thousands of documents a day before his New York trial is scheduled to start. Trump wrote in the post, Election interference has never happened like this in the USA before and hopefully will never happen again. We are now a nation in serious decline, a failing nation, but we will soon be a great nation again. Trump discussed the case at a campaign rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday. On Monday in New York City, I will be forced to sit fully gagged. I'm not allowed to talk. Can you believe it? They want to take away my constitutional right to talk. Mershon imposed a gag order on Trump in March at prosecutors' request, blocking him from speaking about witnesses concerning their participation in the case. He extended the order on April 1st to cover his own family members and those of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, though Mershon and Bragg themselves are not included. Trump lashed out at Judge Mershon, calling him crooked and accusing him of suffering from TDS. TDS. Does anyone know what TDS is? <laughs> Correct. Trump derangement syndrome. Trump called the trial a Biden trial and implied the proceedings were intended to undermine his candidacy. As the radical left Democrat Party seeks to do anything possible to keep me from running and winning in this election. The former president plans to take the stand in the trial. Trump said on Friday, quote, I would testify absolutely and called the trial a scam. The trial will not be televised, with New York having strict rules about cameras in courtrooms. It is expected to take about six to eight weeks. Jury selection starts Monday, and the trial will take place every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, with Wednesday as a break day. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The people of Israel. And joining us now is Dan McMillan, former prosecutor with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Now founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to campaign finance reform. Dan, welcome. Good to see you today. Jury selection today will be watched very closely for signs of bias. How airtight is this process? What are the risks and what should people watch out for? 
Well, on the one hand, we don't really have to worry, I think, about an unfair jury being selected, a jury that's unfair either to defense or prosecution. The process is going to be very rigorous. It's going to take, I think, weeks. Um, okay. It's going to involve an extensive questioning of all potential jurors for any possible source of bias. But on the other hand, uh, every single day, there will be an opportunity for President Trump to hold a press conference denouncing the process, claiming that this or that juror who, in his view, is biased, was nonetheless uh, allowed on the jury. Uh, that has been his approach and that of his attorneys all along. Okay. Um, and it's also an opportunity for President Trump to have a tremendous amount of free media time, um, which has always been one of his strengths campaigning. Even if he doesn't raise as much money as President Biden uh, for campaign advertising and other campaign expenses, yeah. he often, is, as in 2016, has been able to compensate for that uh, by free media time. And Dan, uh, I just want to turn now to... I'm sorry, go ahead. Thanks so much. I just want to turn now to a, a more of the legal aspects here. Bragg's charging Trump under a law that allows him to elevate misdemeanors to felonies. What's the potential impact of this action on the case and on the public's perception of fairness here? Well, the thing is that even legal experts who are Democrats agree this is really a stretch. I mean, strictly speaking, yeah, you can't, Bragg can legitimately turn this, this crime that normally is handled as a misdemeanor into a felony, but it's basically the charge is falsifying public records, uh, falsifying business records to conceal the fact that uh, he funded a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels in the last weeks before the, the 2016 election, because he thought that Dan if Daniels went public, that could embarrass him and hurt him at the polls and not reporting that payment as an in-kind contribution to his campaign was a violation of federal campaign finance law. But it's not a huge violation. It's, it's a stretch to convert this into a felony. And more importantly, I think, in the eyes of the public, it is clear most, most Americans or a lot of Americans see this as pretty small potatoes compared to the other charges against President Trump and mm. consequently uh, feeds the narrative that these prosecutions, that all the prosecutions are politically motivated, which he's been claiming all along. So what evidence and arguments will Bragg need to present to secure a felony conviction from the jury? I, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to offer an opinion. I have not seen the evidence myself, right. not having, and also as a former prosecutor, uh, it's not a good idea to express an opinion about the quality of the evidence if you haven't seen all the evidence. That's fair. Okay, I just want to turn now to President Trump attempting to assert some form of presidential immunity from the charges that he's facing. That was rejected, and the judge said that he waited too long as his reason. How do both those arguments stack up legally? Well, it's hard to see how the presidential immunity argument is relevant to this trial. President Trump has claimed immunity for all actions committed while he was president. This is about an action taken before he was president in the fall of 2016. On the other hand, he has claimed pre immune, this presidential immunity uh, specifically for uh, the charges in, in Georgia of trying to tamper with the result of that election and the charge that he incited the Capitol riot. Okay, um, and I don't know of a single legal expert who takes that seriously, but the Supreme Court is hearing Question is, is taking arguments on that question, the, the yeah. presidential immunity argument, I think on April 25th. Okay, That's so not lastly, been decided Dan, yet. Okay, and just finally, Dan, we have about 20 seconds for your response. How could this, this, these, these decisions made in this case impact future presidents? I think it's going to make future prosecutors hesitate before bringing charges against a former president because I don't think this trial is going to make is going to make all the prosecutions look very good. All right. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Dan McMillan, former prosecutor of the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America. Thank you. Thank you, Stefania. The FBI is investigating the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. 
The bridge collapsed after a support tower was struck by the container ship Dolly, causing the bridge to fall into the Patapsco River on March 26th. A spokesperson for the FBI's Baltimore field office said the agency is present aboard the cargo ship Dolly, conducting court-authorized law enforcement activities. The FBI is reportedly looking into whether or not the crew left the port while aware of the major issues with the vessel, according to the Washington Post. For months, a homeless crisis has overtaken a rural community in southern Oregon. Now the town is attracting national attention as its camping, as its camping ban goes before the Supreme Court this month. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest. Two and three. Ah. Yesterday morning, volunteers assisted an 80-year-old man from his tent into a wheelchair. They helped him move to another park to avoid being fined. I would say um, this, the situation's only escalating and uh, we're seeing more and more people unhoused and at the same time we're seeing more and more friction and frustration from community members on both sides um, because we've been paralyzed for the last few years waiting for um, the court case to be over. I Residents are fed up with drug use and discarded needles next to playgrounds and sports fields in this rural Oregon town. On Saturday, they rallied outside City Hall with signs reading, Parks are for kids. Passing drivers honked in support. For years, I'd go to the park and walk in the park, and I'd see kids playing and the families and all the get-togethers we, we had. And, uh, and that was taken away from us when the campers started using the parks. Cities nationwide have been struggling to address homelessness. Debate over whether they can fine or jail people for camping in public has caused controversy. Families are afraid to go to the parks. And it's not just the campers or the homeless, it's the drug use and the vandalism and the excessive littering. Needles on the ground, broken meth pipes on the ground. So no one wants to take the kids anymore. Grants past Mayor Sarah Bristol wants safe parks, but says the ban doesn't address homelessness. But we, we still have like 200 people who have to go somewhere, and so I just don't really see how the, that resolves um, the issue. Some advocates fear that anti-camping enforcement will push people out of town and perpetuate the issue. If these civil or criminal penalties can be enforced, it will likely uh, go back to a status quo of cycles of incarceration, which uh, also facilitates cycles of homelessness. The High Court will hear the case on April 22nd. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The Rust movie armorer, convicted of involuntary manslaughter, will soon find out her punishment. A judge in New Mexico will sentence Hannah Gutierrez Reed today. The jury found her guilty last month for the onset shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Her job as armorer made her responsible for gun safety and storage on set. Somehow, Gutierrez Reed placed a live bullet in a prop gun Alec Baldwin was holding, and the weapon discharged. Hutchins died, and the film's director also was shot but survived. Gutierrez Reed faces up to 18 months in prison and a $5,000 fine. Prosecutors have asked the judge to give her the maximum. They say she has not taken any responsibility for her actions. While the defense has argued she should receive probation because she has no prior criminal history. And O.J. Simpson's estate executor says Simpson's body will be cremated. He also says Simpson's brain will not be donated for the scientific study of football-related head trauma. Simpson's estate executor Malcolm Laverne served as Simpson's longtime lawyer. The former football star died at the age of 76 last week after battling cancer. Laverne said at least once someone was looking to study Simpson's brain for a disease called CTE. It's a degenerative brain disease associated with head injuries obtained by football players and boxers. CTE can cause mood disorders and changes in behavior, including explosions of anger. Laverne says there is a possible celebration planned to honor Simpson's life. It's set to include only family and close friends. A prison guard is accused of getting prohibited cell phones for inmates. The security supervisor in South Carolina allegedly accepted over $200,000 in bribes. Christine Mary Livingston was indicted on 15 charges, including supplying over 170 contraband cell phones. She has worked at the Broad River Correctional Institution for 16 years. She's accused of working with inmate Gerald Reeves to transfer bribes using Cash App. 
He's serving a 15-year sentence for fatally shooting a man in a convenience store. The two face up to 20 years in prison, a $250,000 fine, and an order to pay back the bribes if convicted. Contraband cell phones in South Carolina prisons are a long-time problem. In 2018, they helped spur a riot in one of the state's prisons. Since 2015, prison officials have discovered over 35,000 cell phones, more than double the number of inmates in the system. Coming up, how are markets reacting to the attack on Israel over the weekend? Don Ma dives into investors' concerns of a wider conflict. And if you haven't filed your taxes yet, we have some tips to help last-minute tax filers meet the deadline. We'll have the details soon when we return. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Genuine.com. Tangazo hili linahusu njaa. Tarajia kuona watoto wakiwa na njaa katika maeneo haya. Mambo yalikuwa bora kwa miaka mingi tuliweza kupigana na njaa na watoto wachache walikufa. Lakini sasa mambo yamebadilika na kwa mabaya zaidi. Hii ni kwa sababu wakati huu hukame umeangamiza zaidi. Через війни та конфлікти ми мусимо залишати наші домівки і всі наші речі. Ми навіть не маємо їжі. Тому нам потрібна ваша допомога. Millions of children are fighting to survive due to inequality, conflict, poverty, and the climate crisis. Save the Children is working alongside communities to provide a better life for children. And there's a way you can help. Please call or go online to give just $10 a month only 33 cents a day. We urgently need 1,000 new monthly donors in the next 30 days to help the children we support around the world. You can help provide food, medicine, care, and protection, plus so much more that a child needs by calling right now and giving just $10 a month. You can help the children of the all we need are 1,000 monthly donors in the next 30 days. Please call or go online now with your monthly gift of just $10. Thanks to generous government grants, every dollar you give can have up to 10 times the impact. And when you call with your credit card, we will send you this Save the Children tote bag as a thank you for your support. Your small monthly donation of just $10 could be the reason a child in crisis survives. Please call or go online to hungerstopsnow.org to help save lives today. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. And joining us now is NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don, good to see you. Good to see you as well. What do you have for us today, Don? Yeah, so of course we have to talk about what's happening in the markets after uh, what happened over the weekend, uh, Iran's attack on Israel. So the good news here is that uh, Wall Street has recovered from Friday's sell-off uh, amid what happened, you know, uh, with uh, the attacks 
on Israel, right? Uh, there was a clear bounce back in U.S. stock futures uh, first thing this morning, and European stocks as well were higher too. Uh, stock markets in Asia, though, were mixed, uh, as many caught up with Friday's late sell-off on, on Wall Street. So a rush to traditional financial havens on Friday has partially uh, reversed uh, since Saturday's drone attack uh, was largely foiled. Uh, so the hope here is that U.S. and Gulf diplomatic efforts would uh, now prevent sort of further escalation of the troubles, if you will. There's a general belief among investors that uh, it isn't going to escalate. But, you know, there's still an element of, of wait and see. So nothing for sure at the moment um, as we wait for Israel's reaction on how Iran and as well as on how Iran responds. Uh, so the uncertainty could actually persist for several weeks or, or more. Yeah, there is a lot to watch for here. How are oil prices looking right now amidst the, all these tens tensions? Yeah, that's also an important factor that is uh, being looked at right now. But for now, at least, it looks like that oil prices have fallen uh, as risk premiums uh, ease amid the Iran attack. So oil prices drift lower this morning with the market downplaying the risk of broader regional contagion. Uh, initially, oil benchmarks uh, on Friday actually rose in anticipation of Iran's retaliatory attack. Um, that's with prices touching their highest ever since October, actually. So Iran telegraphing that it was considering retaliation actually helped lower the geopolitical temperature. And because of Iran's warning ahead of time, an attack was largely priced in over the days leading up to it. Also, the limited damage and the fact that there was actually no loss of life apparently uh, for now means that uh, maybe Israel's response also will be softer. Mm. All right. Thank you, Don. We know you'll be following it. Yep. Thank you. It's tax day and you have just hours left to file a return or request an extension. Otherwise, you might end up paying a fee. It could climb to 25% of the taxes you owe if you wait too long. Here are some tips on how to file or get an extension quickly. Fastest way to get your refund is to electronically file and to receive that refund through a direct deposit. It's not too late to file a tax return or request more time. Some people automatically get an extension. Residents of Maine, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. have an extra day or two for observed holidays. People who live or work in federally declared disaster areas can check their deadlines at irs.gov. It's possible to request an automatic six-month extension for free through an IRS partner on the agency's website. The deadline for that is today, and it involves paying estimated taxes. For those who want to file before midnight tonight... And the IRS this year is attempting a direct file with multiple states. People not in direct file states can check out the IRS's trusted partners. Those with an adjusted gross income of $79,000 or less can file with them for free. Others can use paid services. Experts urge taxpayers to enter information correctly. Something as simple as just you know, fat fingering your social security number, you know, could really cause you a headache. Watch out for scams. If you didn't initiate that contact, go to the source. And avoid late fees. Sometimes people get scared and they're like, oh my goodness, I owe money, I'm not gonna file. And for that, we really encourage people, go ahead and file. All right, and if you use Verizon, you want to know about this. Today is the last day eligible Verizon wireless users can sign up for money for, from a legal settlement. The funds are for customers who used Verizon services between January of 2016 and November of last year. They can get up to $100 by signing up online or through the email, through mail. The lawsuit alleges Verizon deceptively charged fees, which the company denies. People who accept the payouts lose any right to sue Verizon over is the issues in the future. And coming up, a second stabbing in Sydney, Australia in just three days. This time, a bishop was attacked during a sermon. Details on the assault. And Beijing indicates for the first time a man in, in, indicates for the first time a man it executed for spying sold secrets to Washington. More on the U.S.-China spy war shortly here on NTD News Today. I'm Richard Karn.
and I love my hose. It ain't those old hoses. This is my hose. The new Pocket Hose Copper Bullet, now infused with real copper, so your water is always clean and lead-free. Just turn on the water and watch your hose grow and grow. And when you turn off the water, away it goes. Our new inner tube uses three layers of high-strength latex on the inside. Then it's wrapped in a new polymer filament jacket, three times stronger than the other hoses. But my favorite part of our new hose build the oversized, easy to grip fittings. Get the super light 25 foot pocket hose copper bullet today for only $29.99. But wait, call now and get our copper spray nozzle with our exclusive thumb drive free. This is an exclusive release of our newest pocket hose. Order now. Call 1-800-960-8919. That's 1-800-960-8919 or visit copperbullethose.com. Order now. No young person should ever have to worry about having a safe place to sleep at night or a warm meal to eat or whether anyone cares about them. I grew up um, in poverty and I actually came physically homeless uh, right after I had turned 16. I didn't have anywhere to sleep and I didn't really have uh, friends or family that could support me. To be homeless as a teen, I didn't ask for that. One in 10 young adults will experience a form of homelessness this year, and that's unacceptable. But the good news is there is an organization making a big difference, Covenant House. For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month just 63 cents a day, you can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love. For over 50 years, Covenant House has been helping youth in crisis and giving them the support and tools they need to succeed in life. Without the Covenant House, I honestly could not tell you where I would be today. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. I would not be here today if it weren't for the kindness of strangers, people who donated to Covenant House so that they could support me when I couldn't support myself. I have no words to express how Covenant House changed my life. Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Your support makes the work of Covenant House possible. Call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. Want to know what's really happening around the world? Join us for a deep dive discussion with our expert panel on International Reporters Roundtable. Sydney police have identified the perpetrators of the perpetrator of fatal stabbings near Bondi Beach in Australia. People witnessed scenes of, of chaos at a shopping center as the attacker killed six people before being shot and killed by police. New South Wales police say 40-year-old Joel Couchy was responsible. Footage published on social media by an eyewitness showed crowds of people running to evacuate the mall as the body of the attacker laid on the ground surrounded by officers. No, I work in the cafe the way the guy was shot, so like right in front. I'm feeling really terrified to be honest and tired, I don't know, to be honest what I'm, it's like mixed reaction. I sort of turn around and everyone's screaming and sprinting and they're like, it was like a movie, like a horror movie and the fear in everyone's face is just like terrifying and everyone's just pushing and pushing. New South Wales police said five of the six victims killed were women, while eight people, including a nine-month-old baby, was taken to the hospital with stab wounds. At this stage, they did not believe the attack was terrorism-related. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said there was no indication yet of the man's motive. In a written statement, the attacker's family said they were devastated by the events and they had no issue with police shooting their son. They called his actions truly horrific, saying they were still trying to comprehend what had happened. Yeah. The family also said that he battled mental health issues since he was a teenager. And a church in a suburb of Sydney, Australia, was the site of another stabbing today. It came just two days after the deadly attack at the shopping mall. 
And just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing. The church was live streaming when the assault occurred. The video shows a man lunging at a bishop before repeatedly stabbing him during a sermon. A number of people were hurt, but there were no life-threatening injuries. The victims are receiving medical treatment. Officers arrested a male and took him to an undisclosed location. And killed for selling state secrets to America. That's what a Chinese state media campaign seems to suggest. The video clip boasts China's success in combating foreign espionage. It zooms in on a spy called Huang Yu. He was executed in 2016 for selling state secrets. The clip made no mention of the foreign country, but it showed footage of CIA headquarters in the clip. China said he handed over secrets, including military communications, to a foreign government. Media reports say he was executed a month after his conviction. Zooming out, the CIA director last year said the agency has been working to rebuild its spy network in China. Beijing pledged countermeasures in response. Over a decade ago, China rolled up a lot of CIA operations, killing or arresting a dozen or more sources. Last year, China also updated its anti-espionage law, banning the transfer of any information deemed to relate to national security, a move that unnerved some foreign businesses and investors. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz kicked off his China trip yesterday. He first visited Chongqing. It's a metropolis serving as a production base for China's auto industry. His trip comes as Germany continues to rely on China. Berlin said last year that it would de-risk, but China remains Germany's largest trading partner. German direct investment into China hit a record high $12.9 billion, an over 4% increase from the previous year. The country remains a key market for big German companies. Germany's top corporate brass also came with Schultz, including CEOs of Siemens, Mercedes-Benz, and semiconductor chemicals maker Merck KGAA. Schultz is set to visit Chinese leader Xi Jinping in Beijing tomorrow. Advocacy groups are urging him to stress the importance of human rights during his visit. Bombs, airstrikes and nationalism. A viral Chinese propaganda video is drawing mixed reactions from Internet users. Some say it used gaming terminology to depict a World War III scenario with China leading the battle. Let's zoom in. Tanks, aircraft, cannons and boots on the ground. This viral music video shows Chinese troops carrying out rounds of explosions and missile strikes. Its message, the regime's military is, quote, terrifyingly powerful for a new game season. It's an attempt to sort of rally up the gamers and the couch potatoes in China to get with the nationalism sentiment, this overall preparation for war in Taiwan, and to basically test out if people are responding well the term game season often refers to the end of the year world final in gaming competitions. Lately, it's become a reference for World War III among internet users. After the video was released, it triggered a wave of nationalist sentiment online. Some said unlike the previous two world wars, China is prepared to win the third one. Others in the comments section called for a standoff with the U.S. and Japan to unify the world. One of them said, quote, if a world war is to break out, we must first eliminate Japan. At least we should swiftly destroy its military and ammunitions. But are any of these gamers ready to fight on the front line? People that are screaming loudly online aren't combat ready at all. But it's to increase and boost the overall sentiment in China. So it's appealing to the younger audience because that's majority of where you want the fighting force to be, young and active uh, males. The video was put out by a communist youth league account. Some people found the footage contains U.S. military and weapons. It also sparked arguments online. This internet user quoted English novelist George Orwell saying, all the war propaganda, all the screaming and lies and hatred comes invariably from people who are not fighting. So there are comments suggesting, you know, look at what Germany uh, did in the last world war, they thought they were powerful as well, but it didn't end well for them. So never overestimate yourself. Video games are hugely popular among young people in China. It's gotten to a point where esports terminologies 
are often used to compare with real-life scenarios. The CCP is directly in charge of overseeing the gaming sector and has ruled out a number of policies to gain control over the industry. And in more China news, China reacting to Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. More details coming tonight on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Nearly 18 million first-time voters are set to cast their ballots in India's general election. It will take almost seven weeks for everyone to vote beginning this Friday. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a third straight term. Nearly 18 million first-time voters are set to cast ballots in India's general election. It begins on April 19th and runs for almost seven weeks. Leader Narendra Modi is seeking a third straight term, a record only held by India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. Days before voting began, Modi showcased a manifesto that promised to create jobs if he wins. That may be what young voters like 22-year-old Yashraj Singh want to hear. Singh is a student and hip-hop dancer who moved to bustling New Delhi for better opportunities. And he wants a government that understands his struggle. Like they should provide more programs regarding education and uh, employment because a lot of youth is now getting educated but still they don't, don't have good jobs. Delhi native Anam Khan feels the same. I'm 21 years old and as of now I am unemployed and this is the first time I will cast my vote. The fourth of seven children, Khan is desperate to contribute to her family's income. But since graduating from college last year, she has struggled to find a full-time job. We wanted a government which can make provisions for job opportunities. So many people who were educated and have studied are unable to find jobs today. So, as a first-time voter, I will vote for a government which can support the youth. Official data shows nearly 16 percent of India's urban youth between 15 and 29 stayed unemployed in 2022 to 2023 due to poor skills or a lack of quality jobs. Hello. Away from the bustle of the capital in the village of Surana, Aman Yadav's priorities in the upcoming vote look a little different. The 19-year-old has been working his family's land for as long as he can remember. He wants a government that appreciates the hard labors of farmers. Farmers work hard day and night, but they aren't rewarded for their effort. So it is important for the government to implement policies that are in favor of the farmers, so we can get a good crop yield and a fair price for our crop. Reuters surveys of families in rural areas earlier this year showed their income has grown stagnant or gotten worse compared to before the pandemic. A majority of India's population live outside its cities. And in a 2011 census, those areas employed half of its workforce. The general election will be held in seven stages until June 1st. Votes are due to be counted on June 4th and results expected the same day. Now for Strong Mind and Body, we'll look at five natural ways to strengthen your mind. Here's Gina Marie. Scientists are still discovering the extent of the mind's capabilities. Its neuroplastic nature was only recently discovered, but despite popular belief, the human mind can be developed to function optimally. Here are five natural ways to enhance your mind's performance, starting with number one, meditation. Meditation can physically change the human brain. Studies show that it can develop higher folds in the outer region of the brain. These are associated with the brain's ability to process and save information. A study was conducted by Yale University. It revealed that long-term meditation hampers the default mode network of the brain. This network is responsible for purposeless wanderings of the human mind. Similarly, meditation has also been linked with increased cortical thickness in the hippocampus region of the brain. This influences the mind's ability to learn and remember things. Number two, exercise. Exercise increases blood supply to the brain. This strengthens the human mind by enhancing its speech and cognitive function. Exercise can also heighten mental clarity, improve reaction time, and have an antidepressant effect on the mind. Number three, play board games. Board games are an excellent way of strengthening the human mind. Studies have revealed that they positively affect the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex regions of the brain. These regions are associated with various cognitive skills and complex memory functions. Number four, eat right. Foods rich in omega-3 fats such as oysters, sardines and salmon naturally strengthen the brain. Similarly, consuming healthy foods such as nuts, 
green vegetables and fruits leads to an increased mental alertness. On another note, studies have proven that following intermittent fasting can enhance mental power. To boost your mental performance, switch to a clean diet. And finally, number five on the list, sleep. Studies have revealed that lack of sleep can lead to a loss of brain tissue. Since the brain performs the function of repair and maintenance during sleep, getting proper sleep is vital. Studies have proven that people who get at least 8 hours of sleep per day have enhanced memory. If you want to enhance your mind's performance further, scientists suggest socialising, learning a new musical instrument or language and reducing stress. Before we head to break, if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, please email us at news.today at ntd.com. Stay with us, we'll have more stories in just a moment. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We our NTD. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, things I see. I just want to turn away. The dreams I have. The stories I could tell. Will they still be possible? This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere. But it begins here. Changing World, a brighter way of life. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I received two stents in my arteries, stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. I have met so many survivors. Each of them tells a story that can be so helpful to women out there. Everything was pretty good. It was a very happy life. I was given the diagnosis that I had peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is basically a pregnancy-induced heart failure. They told me my only chance was a heart transplant. 
and the American Heart Association help make that possible. Their research helped save me. I think everyone should support the American Heart Association. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR. The next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. You can be part of that very important work that the American Heart Association is doing to save lives everywhere. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. I am grateful for just every day that I get with my children. I am very thankful for the American Heart Association. Heart disease is America's number one killer, and your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Hillsdale College is reaching and teaching millions of Americans to pursue truth and defend liberty. But to do that in an even bigger way, we need your help. Your generous support helps educate students from kindergarten to college, all while refusing every penny of government funding, even indirect funding like student loans or grants. And your dedicated giving allows us to teach millions of Americans through our free online courses. You make all the difference. Give a gift today. Just use this link. What if you could feel in control of your retirement in just a few clicks? At aceyourretirement.org, you can. Start with a free three-minute chat with Avo, your friendly digital retirement coach. Just answer some simple questions like, how do you feel about your ability to save for retirement? Or in how many years do you want to retire? To get free action items customized just for you, get your retirement back on track at aceyourretirement.org. Had former President Trump in court for his so-called hush money trial. Hear him speak as he arrives at the courthouse. Nations calling for restraint following Iran's aerial attack on Israel this past weekend. We had the latest response from President Biden. European stocks rise amid the conflicts in the Middle East. The defense industry is among top gainers. What the numbers are indicating. It's been almost three weeks since the tragic Baltimore Bridge disaster, which killed six people. Now the FBI is getting involved. More on the investigation. In golf, number one ranked Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters in dominant fashion, while a rusty Tiger Woods struggles. Dave Martin will join us to explain. Excitement is building as athletes get ready for today's 128th running of the Boston Marathon. What we know about the event. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Former President Trump's hush money trial is kicking off today with jury selection. Trump is currently in New York courtroom. He made a brief speech as he arrived. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. Scores of people are expected to be called into the courtroom to begin the process of finding 12 jurors plus six alternates. 
There could be some legal arguments in housekeeping before jury selection begins. This is the first criminal trial of any former U.S. president and the first of Trump's four indictments to go to trial. Trump is accused of falsifying internal Trump organization records. It came as part of an alleged scheme to pay off adult film actress Stormy Daniels during the 2016 presidential campaign. Joining us now is our legal correspondent Arlene Richards, who was outside the courthouse just this morning. Arlene, the courtroom filled up fast this morning. What was it like? What was the atmosphere like outside? Well, uh, when I arrived, there were about a two or three blocks of reporters, uh, cameras actually, cameras set up in front of the courthouse. Some reporters were already starting to report. And then as I turned the corner, I had to face a long line of more reporters, which is the line I had to get in to try and get into the courthouse today. Uh, two lines of, of, lawyer, of, of, of attorneys, I mean, <laughs> of reporters, uh, including myself. And then um, there were a few protesters, uh, a handful that were against Trump. Uh, there was a lady with a large sign that pretty much said, convict Trump already. Uh, and then another, another man. And there were a lot of reporters surrounding those two and interviewing them. And then about an hour later, I noticed that a, a big group of Trump supporters arrived with their flags. And there was a little bit of a tussle between them and the, and the anti-Trump protest, anti protesters. And then they were moved to another area, the, the Trump supporters. And that just grew. That got larger and larger uh, as the hour went on. Uh, so I was surprised to see that there were more Trump supporters than anti-Trump because his attorneys have been saying he can't get a fair trial today because most of the Manhattan residents that they surveyed said they already think Trump is guilty. So I was really surprised to see that there weren't more people there who were anti-Trumpers. Um, but otherwise, it was very calm outside, except for there being so many reporters and cameras. It was pretty calm. And so what can we expect to happen inside the courtroom today? Well, a lot's going to go on today. It is the first day of jury selection. Um, so there won't be any witnesses being called and there won't be any opening statements. But they will, as you said earlier, handle some loose ends. So one of those things is this motion to have Judge Mershon recuse himself. Now, this is the second motion the defense has filed asking him to step down as the trial judge because they say that his daughter um, actually helped Biden with his campaign in 2020. Uh, and, but the judge previously said that she's not involved in the trial, so there's no conflict of interest. And I expect he will rule the same today. And the other thing is on Friday, they filed a letter at the last minute um, talking about how tr Trump can't get a fair trial because of this jury questionnaire. Now, there's a 42 question questionnaire that the jurors are each going to have to answer They'll have to stand up and give their answers out loud, and then the attorneys can ask them follow-up questions. And this is how they're going to try and weed out the jurors. Um, and so what the Trump team has said is that they, they did not ask the jurors whether or not they liked Trump. And they feel like if they could answer that question, then it would be easier for the Trump team to weed out people and, and get rid of jurors who don't like him. So they say that's a disadvantage for them. And the other thing is, the jurors have to tell them which political party they are affiliated with, which means that the prosecution will know which party they're affiliated with. That's Trump's party, right? So that's an advantage for the prosecution, they're saying. They will be able to strike those jurors who are possibly in the Republican Party. So I, I think these are a couple of things that the judge will try to address before the jurors even come into the courtroom, but we'll have to see if he will, you know, how he will rule on those things. And what will the attorneys be looking for when they select jurors, Arlene? Well, as we said, most people in Manhattan have an opinion about Trump. Uh, one way or the other, they have this opinion. And as I said earlier, his team has said he can't get a fair trial here because most people already think he's guilty. So they're going to use that as a way to try and strike as many jurors as they possibly can. But the other part of this is that they're going to be looking for jurors who are sympathetic to him, people who maybe can identify what he's going through. And the New York Times said in an article that those people would be younger black men and men who are blue collar, who are policemen, firemen, construction workers, those kind of people, uh, according to a survey that they conducted. Those are the kind of people that Trump should be looking for. And the other thing is what legal experts have said is that they need jurors who have a strong moral compass. And what I mean by that is, 
people who will take this case seriously, who will set aside all of their biases and really look at the case the way the judge instructs them to, which is to apply the law to the facts and make a determination whether or not the prosecution really has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what they're required to do, and not just make an emotional decision. And the prosecution, on the other hand, they have to worry about their star witness, Michael Cohen, who is a convicted liar. And this is something that the defense team is going to push really hard, that this guy cannot be believed for anything that he says. And they're going to be looking for jurors who can set that aside and just listen to his testimony and take it as it is. So those are what the two sides will likely be looking for, and we'll have to see as the week goes on. All right. Thank you for that update, Arlene. Thank you. Trump supporters and protesters are both gathering outside the courthouse to support their side. Take a listen. You can see my signature well, it's not going to be fair. And like I said, if the man steps on the ropes, they're going to try to convict him for murder. And, and this, is, this is not the America I grew up in. It, it's frightening and it's horrible. And people are not speaking out. He's got a gag order by this corrupt judge, Mershon, whose daughter is a Democrat political operative, who's working with Democrats like Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. They literally have the Biden-Harris campaign as a client, working with Adam Schiff to raise millions of dollars for Democrats that are actively fundraising and writing emails. Oh, you don't want to hear this, right? Of course, you want to talk about the bias, and then the media goes away, because nobody wants to talk about how Donald Trump did nothing wrong. Nobody wants to talk about this corrupt judge, Mershon, and his corrupt daughter. This is about what happened in 2016 when Trump tried to squelch information that he viewed as prejudicial to him. He broke the law in doing that. We believe that Alvin Bragg has a good case and that there will be a fair jury of New Yorkers there to judge the information and the law and make a decision. And tensions are high in the Middle East after Iran launched a direct aerial attack on Israel over the weekend. That's right. The White House says President Biden wants to see tensions de-escalate and doesn't want a wider war in the region. Uh, and just because uh, Iran conducted this unprecedented attack, which we and our Israeli partners and other partners thwarted, uh, doesn't mean that we should just accept uh, a, a constant rising escalation in the region. The president's not going to accept that. He wants to see things de-escalate. And everything we're going to do from this point forward is going to be designed to continue to try to, to reach that outcome. Strength and wisdom need to be same, the same sides, the different sides of the same coin. Uh, I've been in close uh, communication with counterparts in the region, and we will continue to do so in the hours and days ahead. Uh, we don't seek escalation but we'll continue to support uh, the defense of Israel and to protect our personnel in the region. Israel is weighing its response following the attack from Iran. The country's war cabinet is meeting now after an earlier meeting last night. Israeli officials said the war cabinet favors retaliation but was divided over the timing and scale of any such response. Biden has told Netanyahu the U.S. will not participate in any Israeli counteroffensive against Iran. The U.S., the U.K., France, Germany, Russia, China, as well as the European Union and, other, and the United Nations all called for restraint. The U.S. military said it intercepted 80 drones and six missiles from Iran and Yemen during the attack on Israel. In a video on social media, Biden thanked U.S. military personnel who helped defend Israel. Hey, you guys are the best in the whole damn world, man. The whole world. Okay, sure. No, that, that's, not, that's not hyperbole, man. Both these, both these squadrons. You're incredible. Absolutely incredible. You made an enormous difference, potentially saving a lot of lives. And thanks to extraordinary skill, the United States helped Israel take down nearly all those incoming missiles. You're, you're remarkable. Mr. President, we thank Later today, Biden will be hosting Iraq's prime minister to discuss regional stability. Their discussion will focus on the economy and the U.S. military presence in Iraq. Portions of Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel were launched from Iraq, and the U.S. knocked down at least one Iranian ballistic missile from its base in Iraq.
Meanwhile, Iran says it didn't make prearranged agreement with any country prior to the attack. Iran's foreign ministry says Tehran notified neighboring countries days in advance, but didn't make any deals. And as tensions escalate between Israel and Iran, there are also updates to the war in Gaza. Israel is pressing ahead with its operations in the territory. Israel overnight launched more airstrikes on Gaza. Israel's military said even while under attack from Iran, they have not lost sight, not for a moment, of their critical mission in Gaza. As fighting continues, displaced Palestinians are heading toward northern Gaza in an attempt to return to their homes. Large crowds of people can be seen walking along the coast. The Israeli military today renewed warnings for Palestinians not to return to, the, to northern Gaza. The military said the area is still in active battle zone. A military spokesman said that Palestinians should stay in southern Gaza where they have been told to shelter. Still to come, if you haven't filed your taxes yet, we have some tips to help last minute tax filers meet that deadline. OJ Simpson's estate executor says the late football star's body will be cremated and his brain won't be donated to study sports head trauma. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. I'm Jonathan Lawson. If you're 50 to 85, I have an important message about security. Write down the number on your screen so you can call when I finish. The lock I want to talk to you about isn't the one on your door. This is a lock for your life insurance, a rate lock that guarantees that once you're insured, your rate can never go up at any time for any reason. But be careful. Many policies you see do not have one, but you can get a lifetime rate lock from Colonial Penn. Call this number to learn more. This plan was designed with a rate lock for people on a fixed income who want life insurance that fits their budget and is simple to get. Coverage options start at $9.95 a month, less than 35 cents a day. Act now and your rate will be locked in for life. It will never increase, guaranteed. This is lifelong coverage that can never be canceled as long as you pay your premiums, guaranteed. And your acceptance is guaranteed with no health questions. You cannot be turned down because of your health. Call for your information kit and read about this rate lock for yourself. You'll also get a free beneficiary planner. Both are free with no obligation. Don't miss out. Call for information, then decide. Read about the 30-day 100% money back guarantee. Don't wait, call this number now. Call now and you'll also get this free beneficiary planner. Use this valuable guide to record important information and your final wishes, and it's yours free just for calling. So don't wait. Call 1-800-357-4821 for your free information. That's 1-800-357-4821. There's no risk or obligation. That number again is 1-800-357-4821. That's 1-800-357-4821. 1-800-357-4821. Call now. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lord Heavenly Father, I pray to you today to guide us tomorrow. Give us strength as we face death. Help us not to be afraid. We know that we are going to be coming to your people. Major media organizations are urging President Biden and former President Trump to hold debates before November's election. About a dozen organizations posted an open letter yesterday. The letter says general election debates have played a vital role in every presidential election of the past 50 years, going back to 1976. 
The letter also says that tens of millions have tuned in to watch the competition for the votes of American citizens. This year, it's uncertain whether the two candidates will face off on a stage ahead of the election. Biden has not publicly committed to debating Trump, although he hasn't ruled it out. Trump has said he would debate Biden anytime, anywhere. The Associated Press, CBS News, CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC, PBS, NPR, and C-SPAN are among the media outlets that released the statement. A new poll shows Trump and Biden remain locked in a tight race for the presidency. The poll by the New York Times and Siena College had 46% of voters say they support Trump. 45% said they are backing Biden. That's a tighter race than the poll's last survey in February when Trump led Biden by five points. The new poll shows 64% of voters feel the country is heading in the wrong direction. Close to 80% felt economic conditions were either fair or poor. Biden's approval rating is 38%. And presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he will not run on the Libertarian Party ticket. The independent candidate tells ABC News he has met with Libertarian Party leaders many times and kept the door open, but now says his campaign doesn't need the party. In January, Kennedy told CNN he was still considering the partnership. He will instead continue to run as an independent. And a New York campaign staffer for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been fired for misrepresentation last week. A video circulated of Rita Palma encouraging an audience to back Kennedy on the New York ballot because it would help former President Trump beat President Biden in November. Palma falsely identified herself as the New York State Director of Kennedy's campaign, according to a campaign spokesperson. After the campaign watched the video, Palma was fired. Palma released a statement after the firing. She said she, she said her time with Team Kennedy was one of the best political adventures of her life. She added that she holds no grudges and looks forward to the next seven months of watching, quote, Bobby Shine. U.S. Senate candidate in Arizona, Car Carrie Lake, reportedly raised more than $4 million during the first three months of this year. But her Democratic opponent, Congressman Ruben G Galeo, nearly doubled what she brought in during the same time period. His campaign says he raised seven and a half million dollars. The winner in November will succeed Kirsten Sinema. The one-time Democrat turned independent decided not to run for re-election this year. Political observers are closely watching the race in Arizona. The outcome could determine which party holds the Senate seat next year. Senate next year. And the FBI is investigating the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. The bridge collapsed after a support tower was struck by the container ship Dolly, causing the bridge to fall into the Patapsco River on March 26th. A spokesperson for the FBI's Baltimore field office said the agency is present aboard the cargo ship Dolly, conducting court-authorized law enforcement activity. The FBI is reportedly looking into whether or not the crew left the port while aware of the major issues with the vessel, according to the Washington Post. The Biden administration will provide up to $6.4 billion in direct funding for Samsung Electronics. The money is to develop a computer chip manufacturing and research cluster in Texas. The funding is part of a total investment that is expected to exceed $40 billion when private money is factored in. The government support comes from the Chips and Science Act, which aims to revive domestic production of advanced computer chips. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says the proposed project will make Texas a state-of-the-art semiconductor destination. Raimondo said she expects the project will create at least 17,000 construction jobs and more than 4,500 manufacturing jobs. The first factory is expected to be operational in 2026 and the second in 2027. And a government worker was found to have broken the law during the January 6, 2021 events at the U.S. Capitol, but wasn't prosecuted. That's according to an internal report from the Treasury Department Office of Inspector General that was obtained by the Epoch Times. The report reveals that the employee was present on Capitol grounds during the breach. The worker denied witnessing violence or engaging in illegal activities, though video evidence contradicted these claims. The employee, who was not named, breached barricades and stayed on the grounds for about two hours. The investigation confirmed that the worker entered restricted areas without authorization. However, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia declined to prosecute the individual in May 2022.
The OIG told the Epic Times the employee is no longer with the Treasury Department, but details about their departure remain undisclosed. And changing track, two bodies were found in Oklahoma after the suspicious disappearance of two women. Officials say the bodies were found in the rural area of Texas County. It's the same location where 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly disappeared. Four people have been arrested and charged with murder in connection with the disappearance. The two women went missing last month while traveling through rural Oklahoma to pick up children. It's still unclear what, if any, relationship the four suspects had with the missing women. The bodies will be transferred to the medical examiner as part of the investigation. Next, O.J. Simpson's estate executor says Simpson's body will be cremated. He also says Simpson's brain will not be donated for the scientific study of football-related head trauma. Simpson's estate executor Malcolm Laverne served as Simpson's longtime lawyer. The former football star died at the age of 76 last week after battling cancer. Laverne said at least once someone was looking to study Simpson's brain for a disease called CTE. It's a degener degenerative brain disease associated with head injuries obtained by football players and boxers. C e CTE can cause mood disorders and changes in behavior, including explosions of anger. Laverne says there's a possible celebration planned to honor Simpson's life. It's set to include only family and close friends. A prison guard is accused of getting prohibited cell phones for inmates. The security supervisor in southern in South Carolina allegedly accepted over $200,000 in bribes. Christine Mary Livingston was indicted on 15 charges, including supplying over 170 contraband cell phones. She has worked at, at the Broad River Correctional Institution for 16 years. She's accused of working with inmate Gerald Reeves to transfer bribes using Cash App. He's serving a 15-year sentence for fatally shooting a man in a convenience store. The two face up to 20 years in prison, a $250,000 fine, and an order to pay back the bribes if convicted. Contraband cell phones in South Carolina prisons are a longtime problem. In 2018, they helped spur a riot in one of the state's prisons. Since 2015, prison officials have discovered over 35,000 cell phones, more than double the number of inmates in the system. And if you use Verizon, you'll want to know about this. Today is the last day eligible Verizon wireless users can sign up for money from a legal settlement. The funds are for customers who used Verizon services between January of 2016 and November of last year. They can get up to $100 by signing up online or through the mail. The lawsuit alleges Verizon deceptively charged fees, which the company denies. People who accept the payouts lose any right to sue Verizon over the issues in the future. And up ahead after the break, Georgian lawmakers come to blows in Parliament. More on a controversial bill that led to the violence. A second stabbing in Sydney in just three days. This time, a bishop was attacked during a sermon. Details on the casualties. The German Chancellor kicks off his four-day China trip. CEOs of major brands join him as Germany tries to de-risk from China. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation, but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from. I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're they drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic and for a lot of people right now the whole world is very very chaotic so I guess that's another reason why 
so many people are very drawn to this. When I started my pillow, it was just a problem solution, one product company. Well, since then, with the help of my dedicated employees, we now have hundreds of products, some you might not even know about. To get the word out, we're having a $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows, $25. My Pillow Sandals, $25. And for the first time ever, our six pack towel sets. You guessed it, just $25. Our brand new four pack dish towels, $25. And I've never done this before. Premium My Pillows with all new Giza fabric, any size, any loft level, even king size for only $25. And there's so much more. So go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code for our $25 extravaganza. Order $75 and over, your entire order ships absolutely free. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, fostering martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The preliminaries for the 2024 NTD International Traditional Martial Arts Competition will be held across New York, Taiwan, and Germany. The grand finals will be broadcast live online worldwide in August 2024. For more information, please call 1 888 477 9228. And now we have some short headlines from the UK, Germany, and other European countries. European stocks cautiously inched up today amid conflicts in the Middle East. Industrial and automobile sectors led as the supply chain has nearly recovered since the pandemic. The defense industry was also among top gainers after Iran launched explosive drones and missiles at Israel over the weekend. The EU is investigating whether China has subsidized green tech exports like EV batteries. Those subsidies could harm European producers. Russia says it considers Western sanctions on Russian metals illegal. A Kremlin spokesman said today the sanctions have already destabilized prices on global markets. The Russian official told a briefing that such sanctions were a double-edged sword and could hurt those who introduced them. The United States Treasury on Wednesday imposed sanctions on two people and two companies. Washington accused them of supporting disinformation efforts directed by the Russian government. The move is part of increasing U.S. efforts to put pressure on Moscow amid its war in Ukraine. Poland has received a transfer of $6.7 billion in European Union funds. The country's new pro-European coalition government has moved to resolve issues with Brussels over the rule of law. Those concerns earlier blocked access to billions in funding. The European Commission announced in February that Warsaw could accept up to $145 billion after the new government began implementing judicial reforms. Poland is expected to submit its second the third applications for funds by the end of August. The next round of funding could be as much as $10.6 billion. Poland plans to spend the money on clean air initiatives, expanding broadband internet coverage and roads and railways. Voters in Croatia today prepared for Wednesday's parliamentary election. Polls indicate the conservative HDZ party will lose its majority after a series of graft scandals. A social democrat-led coalition could change the small country's stance on major issues such as support for Ukraine. The main rival to the country's prime minister opposes aid for Ukraine unlike the majority of EU member states. The HDZ has dominated politics since Croatia's independence from a crumbling Yugoslavia in 1991. The party has overseen its accession to the EU and the Eurozone and a tourism boom along its stunning Adriatic coast. Georgian lawmakers came to blows in Parliament Monday due to a controversial bill. The bill is focused on so-called foreign agents. The measure would require organizations that accept funds from abroad to register as foreign agents or face fines. Footage shows the ruling Georgian Dream Party's leader being punched in the face by an opposition member of Parliament. The incident prompted a wider brawl between several lawmakers an occasional occurrence in Georgia's often raucous 
Parliament. Australian police on Monday said the attacker who fatally stabbed six people at a busy shopping centre in Sydney's beach suburb on Bondi, of Bondi may have targeted women as the country mourned the victims and hundreds of people laid flowers near the scene. Australian police say the attacker who fatally stabbed six people in Sydney may have targeted women. The weekend attack took place at a busy shopping centre in the beach suburb of Bondi. Hundreds have mourned the victims at the scene, including Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Five of the six people killed and most of the 12 injured were women, according to New South Wales State Police Commissioner Karen Webb on Monday. It's obvious to detectives that that um, seems to be uh, an area of interest that the offender had focused on women and avoided the men. Witnesses have described how 40-year-old attacker Joel Couchy ran through the mall with a knife and was subsequently killed by Inspector Amy Scott, who confronted him solo while he was on the rampage. The only man who was killed by Couchy during the attack was a mall security guard. Police added Couchy had mental health issues in the past and there was no indication that ideology was a motive. Violent crimes are rare in Australia. The country of 27 million has some of the world's toughest gun and knife laws. A church in a suburb of Sydney, Australia, was the site of another stabbing today. It came just two days after the deadly attack at the shopping mall. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing. The church was live streaming when the assault occurred. The video shows a man lunging at a bishop before repeatedly stabbing him during a sermon. A number of people were hurt, but there were no life-threatening injuries. The victims are receiving medical attention. Officers arrested a male and took him to an undisclosed location. And next up, killed for selling state secrets to America. That's what a Chinese state media campaign seems to suggest. The video clip boasts China's success in combating foreign espionage. It zooms in on a spy called Huang Yu. He was executed in 2016 for selling state secrets. The clip made no mention of the foreign country, but it showed footage of CIA headquarters in the clip. China said he handed over secrets, including military communications, to a foreign government. Media report he was executed a month after his conviction. Zooming out, the CIA director last year said the agency has been working to rebuild its spy network in China. Beijing pledged countermeasures in response. Over a decade ago, China rolled up a lot of CIA operations, killing or arresting a dozen or more sources. Last year, China also updated its anti-espionage law, banning the transfer of any information deemed to relate to national security, a move that unnerved some foreign businesses and investors. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz kicked off his China trip yesterday. He first visited Chongqing, its metropolis serving as a production base for China's auto industry. His trip comes as Germany continues to rely on China. Berling said, said last year that it would de-risk, but China remains Germany's largest trading partner. German direct investment into China hit a record high, $12.9 billion, an over 4% increase from the previous year. The country remains a key market for big German companies. Germany's top corporate brass also came with Schultz, including the CEOs of Siemens, Mercedes-Benz, and semiconductor chemicals maker Merck KGAA. Schultz is set to visit Chinese leader Xi Jinping in Beijing tomorrow. Advocacy groups are urging him to stress the importance of human rights during his visit. And in France, a newspaper recently uncovered Chinese connections behind a large-scale smishing campaign in Paris. We have the details on what happened. French newspaper Liberation reported in March that a Chinese arms dealer supplied IMSI catchers to a gang that conducted drive-by smishing scams in Paris. Smishing refers to sending fake text messages that prompt users to click on a link containing malware. The intention is to trick people into sharing personal data. IMS eye catchers are eavesdropping devices that can track mobile phone traffic. They essentially function as fake mobile towers. French police uncovered the scam when they found a driver in a car behaving suspiciously back in December 2022. The car had been driving repeatedly in the suburbs of Paris while carrying IMSI catchers. 
The gang sent out smishing messages and collected phone numbers from hundreds of thousands of mobile devices nearby. The French newspaper reported that the man behind the IMS eye catchers is a Chinese national called Kevin Yin. He allegedly travels around the world and sells high-end surveillance and spying equipment. French authorities identified Yin after discovering an almost $20,000 digital payment from the Paris gang and after cooperation with the U.S. law enforcement. Yin was later arrested in Geneva, Switzerland while trying to board a flight. The French paper reported that Yin admitted to working for Chinese technology company Thinkwell and selling equipment to the Paris gang. The case has prompted privacy concerns in Europe and concerns over the Chinese regime's access to personal data. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And in more China news, China reacting to Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. More details coming tonight on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And up ahead in golf, number one ranked Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters in dominant fashion, while a rusty Tiger Woods struggles. And today's Dave Martin joins us to explain. And cancer is rising in young people, but what's the cause? We sit down with a senior fellow from Stanford's Hoover Institution. The 128th Boston Marathon is underway, and it looks like the weather is cooperating for over 30,000 runners. More when we come back. How'd it happen? She showed up dead on arrival. This never gets easier. It does when you call Car Shield before your car breaks down. Look at these prices. The camshaft, transmission, engine. Don't people know? A plan through CarShield could protect up to 5,000 parts and systems. You hate to see it. An out-of-warranty car is going to break down eventually. Right, which is why they need a plan through CarShield. Those expensive repair bills get paid and at the mechanic of their choice. They're notifying the family. Poor guy. He doesn't even know what's coming. Another victim of senselessly expensive repair bills. Can't save them all. But we can keep trying. Mm. Didn't have to end this way. If he'd have just called Car Shield before his car broke down. <sighs> exactly. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in cost for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantee. Call 800-429-5128. We all know that words have power. They set things in motion. And make us happy or sad. But there's one word that stands out because when people say it, lives are changed. It's not a big word. It's itsy bitsy. It's only three little letters. But when you say it, the life of a kid like me can be changed. So what is this special word? It may surprise you. It's yes. 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 Yes to becoming a monthly supporter of Shriners Hospitals for Children. That's right. Your monthly support allows the doctors and nurses at Shriners Hospitals for Children to give the most amazing care anywhere and change the lives of kids like me. And me. And me. Because people like you have said yes. Now I can play football. And I can play catch. And I can walk. So what do you say? Will you say yes right now? It's so easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone or go to loveshriners.org right now and say yes. When you say yes to giving just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we'll send you this adorable love to the rescue blanket as a reminder of all the kids you're helping every day. My life is filled with possibility because of the monthly support of people just like you who called the number on your screen and said yes. 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 Your yes is making a difference in my life and the lives of so many other kids like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Please call or go online now if operators are busy, call again or go to loveshriners.org to say yes right away. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, Scotty Scheffler won the Masters yesterday in dominant fashion. 
Uh, heading into the event, though, last week, was he mentioned as a favorite? Yeah, actually, for sure. I mean, he's, he was actually probably the, the overwhelming favorite to win this. I mean, he's ranked number one in the world right now. This is his second major title after winning the same event two years ago. And his eighth PGA win overall in just like a two-year period and third in like the last five weeks or something. He's really hot. Now, heading into the final round Sunday, he had just a one-stroke lead, but he pulled away on the back nine. He will claim the $3.5 million winner's prize. That's the most they've ever given out. Now, he may not have the same, of course, name recognition as a Tiger Woods, of course, but, you know, if he keeps playing like he did uh, Sunday there, he'll definitely get there. All right. Now, Dave, speaking of Tiger Woods, a lot was made of him making the cut here. Where did he end up? Well, he had a tough weekend. He ended up uh, last 60th place out of the 60 who made the weekend cut, though. That was just a big thing for him to make the weekend cut. But he had his worst round ever at the, uh, the Masters on Saturday. Um, he had, it was a 10 over par. That included back-to-back -back double bogeys, as well as four straight single bogeys in the back nine. He then followed that up with a better round four on Sunday, except for a triple bogey there on the fifth. It still ended up as his worst 72 horse score as a professional. Now, afterwards, he actually called it a good week. You know, I can I can sort of understand. I mean, this is the first time he was able to finish a major in like two years. He's had so many injuries. I mean, this is just his seventh overall event in the last three years since he had that car accident. Uh, of course, to see one of the greats in the game and really struggle like this, it's surprising for us, but you're going to be rusty if you don't play that much. Now, looking forward, he's planning to play once a month for the next few months, so maybe some of that rust wears out. Mm. Let's get switch gears to basketball, Dave. The NBA playoffs start this week, but first we have the two four-team play-in tournaments. How do these work exactly? It's a very unusual four-team tournament between the seven through ten seeds in both conferences, like you said. Now, what they'll do is have the seven team, the seven seed, take on the eight seed. The winner automatically advances to the playoffs to take on the two seed, but the loser isn't actually out yet. They also have the nine seed play the ten seed. The loser of that game is out, but the winner isn't actually in. They'll take on the loser of that seven versus eight game. Uh, so they give the higher seeds more opportunities to advance, plus they get home court advantage. Uh, the seeds, of course, are based on their win-loss records during the regular season. Now, this whole setup is really to um, in get, include more teams into possibly getting into the playoffs so as to prevent against tanking. Now, tanking is like a fancy word for losing on purpose to get a higher draft pick, you know, in, in hopes of getting like the next LeBron James or something like that. I'm not sure it accomplishes that. It certainly makes for an entertaining, albeit somewhat confusing, first week of the playoffs. Sure does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us as always, well, Dave. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. What's behind the increase in cancer among young people? A new study claims it's linked to accelerated aging, a concept related to stress that some doctors are skeptical of. For a closer look at the cause, I spoke with Dr. Scott Atlas, senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and former advisor to the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Dr. Atlas, thank you so much for joining us. What do you make of the study claiming accelerated aging is the cause for the rise in cancer among young people? Well, I... I... I think we, we know the data is that there's an increasing uh, incidence of cancer in younger people. Uh, the cause is a lot more complicated. I, I'm not, I think there's a lot of conjecture going on. The thing I want to get out about this is there's been a marked decrease in the use of medical care, particularly over the past five years. When you look at what happened during the lockdowns, there were two things that happened. Medical facilities were closed and people were falsely informed that they should be afraid of coming into medical facilities. And the data is quite striking for younger people, particularly, uh, particularly given that they had very little risk from COVID. There's a significant drop in the use of preventive care. Uh, where things like 40, 50 percent of decrease in use of preventive care of young people, of primary care appointments in outpatient facilities dropped uh, to 50 to 70 percent, of actual hospital admissions for young people with diseases. They weren't coming in for medical care. And when you stop using medical care, ultimately you pay the price. Uh, and that is, in this case, I think, increasing uh, other diseases finally coming to fruition or you know, being visible like cancer. So the bottom line is this, 
we have an increase in cancer incidence in young people. We don't know the real cause, but we know this, that there's been an absence of medical care, an absence of medical attention to young people, and we've had increasing risk factors for cancer, including things like obesity, including things that are uncertain yet, like increased smoking and things like this. And Dr. Atlas, I want to come back to the term accelerated aging. How do the scientists who use this term explain it? And is there any evidence we're getting older faster? I think there's a stretching of what's happening and a, uh, a conjecture about accelerated aging. Uh, 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 these people that are invoking this are, in, are, are ascribing that from a variety of things, including increased stress, etc. I, I think we have to put the brakes on sort of long, far-reaching guesses as to what's happening and look at the most obvious things, which are those that I have uh, articulated here. Yeah, and everything you're saying seems to point to a broader issue you talk about often. Is there something fundamentally wrong with the scientific approach to health these days, and what explains that? There is something that's been exposed by really uh, the pandemic and the, the dissemination of information, the lack of the free exchange of ideas, uh, the use of science in scientific journals and public health leaders to persuade people rather than talk about facts. Now, I think uh, because of that, that that factually happened during the pandemic and the lockdowns, uh, the result of that is the loss of trust and it's deserved. And I think this is a huge problem where, you know, more than half the population does not trust science itself where the faith uh, in CDC and FDA have dropped dramatically. And I, I think we need to fix that. Uh, I mean, we saw some data that over $300 million in shared royalties was given to NIH employees during the decade before COVID on drugs that they evaluated. I think we have a lot of substantial problems in our system right now that need to be fixed in order to restore trust and really credibility in, in what is important, which is good science. Yeah, and if, if our scientific medical approach is off, I mean, how successful can we be in understanding real causes and solutions uh, scientifically? Well, well, we can't, and so that's why we need things like decentralizing uh, the funding of scientific research. I, I think people don't understand how science is conducted. The NIH controls uh, basically all academic science. And why do I say that? Because all academic scientists' jobs require an NIH grant. And so uh, what happens, uh, and I'm someone who's had multiple different grants, including from the NIH, and I've reviewed grants and been on editorial boards and editorships of journals, is that scientists uh, will alter what they're doing in order to achieve an NIH grant. And there's a small cadre of people at the top of grant approvals, journal uh, publication approvals, et cetera, that control what is funded. And so. Uh, it's very difficult for people to do research that is uh, not necessarily wanted by the NIH. And secondly, they're not going to speak out on how to reform the system because their entire careers are, are jeopardized if they do. The other point that I'd like to uh, say is that there's more than 15 university medical centers in the United States that each receive over $500 million per year in funding from the NIH. So you have a half a billion dollars a year to these academic medical centers every year. They're not likely going to speak out against malfeasance, bias, poor science at the NIH because they don't want to jeopardize that funding. So we have a long ways to go. There are specific remedies to these situations. We need, we need leaders who understand them and are willing to uh, make the tough decisions on fixing things. All right, Dr. Scott Atlas, thank you so much. Okay, thanks for having me. And the 128th Boston Marathon is underway. 30,000 athletes from 129 countries are competing in the long distance race. The race held annually on Patriots Day is one of the more challenging of the world's six major marathons, but the weather appears to be cooperating. Highs of 63 degrees with clouds in the morning and sun in the afternoon. Four time Super Bowl champion Rob Gronkowski is serving as Grand Marshal. This year, it marks 11 years since the deadly bombing at the marathon. Three people died and more than 260 were injured that day. 
Sissy Lemma wins the men's pro race for his first Boston Marathon win. And Helen Obiri of Kenya defended her title in the women's race. Obiri is the first woman to win back-to-back -back Boston marathons since 2005. And that's it for us today. For Round the Clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern with Stephanie Cox. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. See you then.